Hello everyone and welcome to our Fail Fast, Fail Cheap webinar. We appreciate you taking time out today to join us. The webinar is scheduled to go for just about 30 minutes. We will end just a few minutes before that. We'll take questions and if people have questions as they continue, we will stay on the line for an additional few minutes to gather up anything we've gotten. So just to get started, um, we do have a quick little note for you on how to use GoToWebinar. Uh, we've mentioned before, but as you're getting online here, you may want to join via phone versus through your computer. The audio quality tends to be a bit better if you do dial on uh, using your telephone. You might want to do that. And then there's a few other options for you. If you want to go to the full screen to see this as big as you can, there's that button to hit that. And then secondarily, if you have questions as we go along, we do invite you very much so to ask those. We will save all those questions until the end when we'll address them as quickly as we possibly can, but to make sure to get to everybody. So as you have questions, just shoot us a little note through that questions box and we'll um, cover them one by one. So hello everyone, my name is Maggie Nichols. I'm the Chief Operating Officer here at the Eureka Ranch and I'm gonna give you a cliff note version of Fail Fast, Fail Cheap. Now this whole program this afternoon is gonna be taken from something we call the Innovation Engineering Body of Work, Body of Knowledge. What we bring it to you from is the Innovation Engineering Institute. Now this curriculum is taught worldwide, 48 different skills on how to create, communicate, commercialize, and systematize innovation inside organizations. So you can imagine with that much content, it's a full undergraduate um, minor, graduate certificate, executive program, it's going to be just a drip that I'm going to give you this afternoon to talk specifically about how to fail fast, fail cheap with innovation. Before I get started though, I wanted to share with you a little bit of an excerpt from a video we have of the CEO, well the former CEO of Tesco. Now if you're familiar with Tesco, one out of every eight pounds in the UK is spent at a Tesco store. Now here's their CEO talking about how failure is fundamental to innovation. The point there is that when you innovate, it isn't all going to work. Uh, and you've got to see success and failure as two sides of the same coin. If you try to manage in order to avoid failure, you'll have no success. Uh, and that's the cultural thing. And most organizations are terrified of things going wrong. Yeah. People are personally terrified of being associated yeah. with failure. And that's inimical to innovation and creativity. I mean, in a way, what innovation is, it's the ability of an organization to change as its outside world changes. You've got to have that in an organization and go on changing. So there we hear it's critical to have failure. You have to in order to succeed. And yet here's the data that's staring us in the face. We do an audit regularly of CEOs and executives and companies all across the world. And we ask them here, you can see a base size of over 12,000. What's your attitude towards taking action on new ideas? Look at how much fear there is that's rampant inside organizations today. Fear is rampant all over the place. Failure is fundamental and yet they have lots of fear. Well, what about their optimism? Well, we find their optimism levels about their ability to innovate are also just as dismal. So here we are talking about the importance of failure and yet companies and organizations across the world are having a hard time figuring out how to make that a fundamental part of what they do. They have no courage, they have no optimism towards taking action. Tough situation. Now when I'm talking about failure, just to set the record straight, I'm not talking about failure in market. I'm talking about failure early on in the innovation process in order to get you to success. We look at an innovation pipeline much like this. So you're gonna define some ideas that you find that are interesting, you're gonna take them through a cycle of some experimentation, move them into development, and then into delivery. There's a money decision to be made. The big decision makes, or the big decision that you make is right before you take something into development, that's when it gets expensive. That's when you're using time, you're using money, you're using energy of your organization to build something and make it real. What we want you to do is use fail fast, fail cheap before that. That's where it goes. Cycles of experimentation, failing fast and failing cheap, and learning before you go into that costly development system. The whole point is that you fail here up in the front, not here back in the back. 
Now, there are lots of systems that you have to have in place in order to be successful with innovation. Fail fast, fail cheap systems are one of many, but they are one of the most critical in order to ensure that your organization is really swinging for the fences when it comes to innovation. Now, before we started this webinar, one of the questions we got in advance is, what the heck is fail fast, fail cheap anyway? And it's so funny because we do coin the phrase. In fact, the Circle R is, is attributed right here to us at the Institute here in Cincinnati, Ohio, home of uh, the Institute at the Eureka Ranch. But I hear it coined and used all over the place. Now, it's a very viral type of concept, so what is it? Well, it is a quick and inexpensive way to learn whether or not an innovation really has legs. Excuse me for just one second. To figure out whether or not an innovation really has potential. Now, said another way, and this may seem obvious, but I see this in a lot of organizations, it's also the opposite of failing slow and failing expensive. Almost every executive that I talk to and every innovation practitioner talks about how long it takes sometimes to get something done in innovation and how expensive it can be. Well, the whole point is how can we prototype this and understand its potential before we actually invest lots of time, energy, money, and resources? So as I mentioned before, I'm just gonna glean, I'm gonna take you off the top level, off the surface of the curriculum. I'm gonna give you five ways here in this web webinar on how to fail fast, fail cheap inside your organization. There's lots more where this came from, but just five for today. I'm gonna to give you this slide again at the end of the presentation, and for those of you who are curious, we are recording it as well. Now, way number one, clearly label the fear. Clearly label the fear. Now, in order to get you to fully understand what I'm talking about, I need to back up for a second and teach you our equation for coming up with innovations. Now, for us, innovation isn't just innovation for innovation's sake. We have a term that we call innovations, and that is things that are meaningfully unique. They can be products, services, systems, business methods, you name it, but how are they meaningfully unique? In order to create that meaningfully unique idea, you need three things. Stimulus. How much stimulus you can bring to the table helps you expand your mind to what's possible. Future trends, technologies, what your competition is doing, um, insights from your customers, things that are completely unrelated, wisdom from out in the, um, in the marketplace today. That's one way to build ideas. You expand that stimulus by leveraging the diversity inside your organization and outside. Who are the different brains that you can bring to bear using that stimulus to help you create ideas? See, people that see the world differently than you do that can help you expand upon that stimulus. Last but not least though, we need to minimize the amount of fear inside an organization. Because if I'm too fearful to share my idea, well automatically we're gonna reduce our odds of actually creating great ideas. So if I've done it right, and there's a whole other class on stimulus diversity and all those pieces, but if I've done it right, I've created an idea that's truly meaningfully unique. And almost by characteristics themselves, a characteristic of an idea that's meaningfully unique means one that sparks fear, because it means change. And we find the more fear that's rampant and the more change that's required, the more we're gonna shut down on big innovations. Now, I talked to you before about being clear, and what I mean by that, being clear about, is actually to relabel those fears and anxieties you have about your innovation and relabel them as death threats. So this is a, a term from psychology, and it's all about taking emotionally charged words and making them not personalized, but making them more objective. So not here we can't make it, we can't afford it. How can we figure out how to relabel those as death threats, as problems to solve? How can we be clear about what the problem is that we need to solve for this innovation? What keeps us up at night? Now we're not the only ones that see this as an important thing to do. We call them death threats. Well at P&G they call them killer issues. These killer issues are the things that Laffley talks about as the flipped sequence. How do we deal with killer issues first? rather than dealing with them later on when it's more expensive. So let me show you this in a different way. What we recommend is rather than going into any particular project for innovation and listing off all the things you have to go and do, flip the order. List all those problems that you have, but those things that are big death threats, we want you to start working on them first rather than over on the small stuff, which can be tempting because you get a lot of mini wins with the small stuff. We don't want you to start over here because you'll waste time, money, and energy 
doing the small stuff that doesn't matter only to die six months later because you haven't addressed a death threat. So principle number one for fail fast, fail cheap is be clear about what that critical death threat is for your particular idea or innovation. Part two, structure an experiment to go right after that particular death threat. Now this is not original. I have to admit it's completely not original work. We call this fail fast, fail cheap cycles in its most specific um, embodiment. It's also called plan do, check act, plan do, study act. It's also called the Deming cycle. It's also called the scientific method you learned when you were in second grade. It's how do we take an experiment and run an experiment against the most critical issue we have on any business topic as it relates to this innovation. Now, most companies can do this in about seven days. We have world-class innovators that do this cycle on an hourly basis. How do I go learn more and structure an experiment around my death threat? So to zoom in a little closer on that lens, what we want you to do is do plan, do, study, act on your innovation. Your plan is your death threat. Customers won't care about this innovation. Do, what experiment are you gonna run to see if customers would care? Study, let's evaluate the experiment's outcomes. Act. Do we carry on with the project? Could we not overcome the death threat and the project needs to be stopped? Or do we move and change the idea to adapt to make it a new version? What we don't want you to do is what we do in the old world, where we instead just inspect something to death and we study it, study it, study it, study it, study it until we don't have to do anything left and the market's passed us by. Instead, what we want you to do is fail fast, fail cheap. Run small experiments week after week to get smarter about critical issues so that you reduce the risk on the idea before you put it into development. Label those big things, run an experiment, so that before you go into the development process here, you're actually doing that experimentation and making smarter decisions by putting a process in at the front to do fail fast, fail cheap on the ideas. It's like making the input to your system be as good as the output. Garbage in is garbage out. Let's increase the odds of the things that go into the front to help us in the long run. So we gotta clearly label the death threats. Second, we need to run an experiment. We need to get that philosophy in place in our organization. Third, we need ways to make it easy to fail fast, fail cheap. So. And the first two, you might say, okay, on a personal level, I could do that. I've got an interesting challenge, a project I'm working on at work. I've not been clear about what my most critical death threats. I could figure that out and then reorder my work to make sure I work on those things first to make sure that the idea has legs. But from an organizational perspective, if I have to go figure out what that experimentation method is over and over and over again, it gets very expensive. How can I support my whole organization doing fail fast, fail cheap? Uh, along with just me. Well, the first way is through building easy systems to do prototyping. How can I make it easy for those people in my organization to prototype something, to see if it's gonna work? Now, there is one super fast, super easy way to do a prototype that anybody can do with no budget, and that is write your idea down. Be clear about what the idea is and put it in prose. Tell me who's the customer for this idea, what's the problem that it addresses, what's the problem or promise that I can offer to overcome that problem, and then what's the proof that I could actually do it. That simple construct can make ideas live or die pretty simply. Sometimes I feel like I've got an idea in my head, but if I can't communicate it and I can't prototype it by writing it down in that simple way, then I probably don't have much of an idea at all. Again, we've got a whole course on specifically how to communicate ideas, but at its simplest, who's the customer? What's the problem? What's the promise? What's the proof? Another way to prototype is to actually build systems for prototyping inside your organization. You know, what can you do to make it easy for someone to waddle in with some small spark of an idea and figure out how can I walk more confidently out the door because I've tried it in some way? Now sometimes building that prototyping mechanism can mean you add a little bit more money to building the system for prototyping, but in the long run, you save more because you make it easy for people to try something. Let me give you a couple examples. This one you see up here on the screen right now, this is a test device we used when we were working with an inventor who had just created a new type of hammock. Couldn't figure out though the support system, should it be two piece, three piece, how should it hang, what should it hang from, what are the testing devices? 
So we built this basic frame so that very quickly we could try multiple models to see what worked. It took just hours to build and then one day we had a prototype that was pretty solid. Other companies do it too. Here's a great example, Legal's Test Kitchen. So if you ever go to Legal's Seafood in Boston, you'll find this actually out in the, um, at the airport. So you can try some of their new dishes before they actually get introduced into the main restaurant. And in fact, the concepts become so cool, they actually have LTK out in lots of places now, Legal's Test Kitchen, where you're always gonna find really innovative dishes. So to connect the dots, and I'll do this a couple times during this webinar, I just want you to think, be mindful, how could you build prototypes or build systems for prototypes so that people in your organization would find it easy to try and test things? What could you have available for them? You know, here at the Eureka Ranch, where we have companies come in all the time to try to build new ideas, new innovations for their customers, we'll do something as simple as have some Play-Doh, have some um, popsicle sticks, all sorts of manner and mechanism of small, simplistic things that, sure, kids would use, but it allows us to get tactical or tactile and try something in a different medium than just words on a page. Trying something in a prototyping method. It doesn't have to be physical stuff. You could prototype with screen flows, screenshots, workflow processes. How could you prototype? How could you build systems to help people prototype? <clears throat> Another dimension to this, ways to make it easy for people to engage in customer feedback. So people ask me this on a regular basis. They ask me, when should customers come into the equation when it comes to innovation? Should it be before I start innovating? Uh, should it be during? Should it be after, after I've got something to show them? The answer is yes. All of those places are imperative to have customers at the table. But the key is not to ask the customers what they want, because they can't always tell you that, but rather to use them as a system for feedback. Said another way, here's a great quote by Dr. Deming. <clears throat> Excuse me, he said, did customers ask for the electric light? No, they never asked for it. The producer produced it. He says, innovation comes from the producer, from the people who are responsible for themselves and have only themselves to satisfy. Or, as Henry Ford said it, if I had asked people what they wanted, they'd have said faster horses. Now again, I'm not telling you not to use customers, not at all. I'm just simply asking you not to always ask them where they wanna go next. They don't know what's possible. It's up to us to figure out what's possible. So how do we build systems to get them engaged? Because here's what I see happen inside organizations. We know it's important to get customer feedback, but that can be really slow and expensive. Gosh, I gotta feel the whole study, it takes a while, I gotta get so many people. So what ends up happening in actuality is people don't use it, they use their gut, and they gamble instead. So how can we make it easy to connect with those customers or systems for prototyping or connecting especially with people who aren't our customers today that we hope will be customers? Let's take the responsibility to figure out how we're gonna build systems to make it easy for them to get feedback rather than them doing them themselves. Now what we teach in the curriculum is actually building customers and prototyping into every single stage of taking an innovation to market. From the very beginning when you're writing a prototype all the way through to when you're actually doing discovery and development into delivery. Now in doing that, we've had to build a suite of research tools to help us get smarter and help put things, make it easy for the people close to the work to be able to get that feedback. No, I'm not here to tell you about the research tools, but I am here to tell you about the learning that we got on two ends of the spectrum that can help you when you're thinking about fail fast, fail cheap. And that is at the front and at the back. Now the first story I'm gonna to talk to you about is about insight mining, and more, and more specifically about addressing customer problems. So a very simple way to figure out whether or not you're onto something with customer problems and to figure out how do you fail fast, fail cheap, and to know whether or not you're onto something worth solving is to ask them, what's the frequency, how often do you have your, this problem, and how big of a problem is it when you get impacted by that? Then building a simple graph, just like this one, it can help us to understand, all right, let's solve problems that matter versus problems that don't. Now you may be telling yourself, or you may be saying next, to the person sitting next to you watching this webinar, of course, that's obvious. Of course we should solve problems that actually exist. Well, we work with all kinds of companies in all sorts of ways, and this is an actual excerpt from an organization that we work with that is a top tier technology company in their field. They wanted to solve a problem 
and they said, you know what, here's the innovation challenge we have for you, dear innovation engineering team. We fielded a study with their customers to find out the exact issues that they wanted to address were no longer important and no longer frequent. They did not matter anymore to their customer set. So one way to figure out how you're gonna get fail fast, fail cheap happening is how can you build systems to understand the current and potential customers' big and frequent problems? How could you find ways to go out and reach out to your customer base or those potential customers you have to understand what issues that they have worth solving? Sometimes that can help you fail fast, fail cheap. The other thing I wanna share with you from that whole set of research tools and what we learned by building them is something called rapid test. And there's ways you can make this real inside your organization to help fail fast and fail cheap. Rapid test is about getting customer feedback. And the story I wanna tell you here is actually from a rapid test system that's used all around the world by a company called the Edrington Group. They're at a place now where they can afford to test all kinds of ideas in order to find the wows that stand up. And what they do is they test multiple things at once, actually. They test the concept itself, so the idea and its written form. They test the packaging, and they test the product. Now, as you can probably see a little bit from this graphic, they're into the alcohol industry. Now, that's a shot of Famous Grouse, which is one of their brands that they do a lot of testing with, but their whole suite of alcoholic products are available to do this rapid test with. So here's how it started. They initially made uh, these fantastic carts that they would take out to festivals all over the world. And that way it was a great opportunity for them to get customer feedback. Gosh, of course, right? There's a festival going on, we're gonna try our new products, set up a booth so that people could come up, take a sip, tell us what they think, and they make us smarter. Well, now what they've done is they've taken that tiny little concept of going to festivals and they've made it a worldwide full-time lab that they use. So literally, anytime, any week across the world, you may walk into a bar that's part of the Edrington Group's test scenarios. And what they do is they go in, they, uh, they go up to a person at the bar, they show them a concept, and I can blow up one of these photographs here. They show them the concept, describe it. Here she's holding an iPad in her hand. She's, ask, she's answering a couple questions on purchase intent and new and different. So how likely am I to buy that? And how different is it? Then they even try the spirit and they'll answer the questions again. They'll flip the, vi the um, iPad around and they'll take video of the customers giving feedback. It's a fantastic new system that they have in place that's encouraged people inside the organization at Edgerton to be more adventurous with the types of new products and services that they come up with because they have a simple system that's used all the time to test the viability of those ideas and what customers think. So to connect the dots back to you again, how could you build regular feedback loops to get customer feedback all the time? And yes, I do hear all the time, you know what, I can't get access to customers, Maggie. It doesn't matter for me. I'm in a business to business realm or we don't talk directly to customers. No excuses. There's plenty of ways for you to get feedback. Talk to the people that talk to your customers to get smarter. Connect to others that are smart in the industry to get smarter about it. Talk to one customer. It doesn't matter who it is in the supply chain. You can get smarter in lots of different ways. Way number four, function over form, let it be ugly. Now, if we were, if innovation were about perfection, people would never ship. So in order to keep things fast and the costs low, you gotta let it be ugly. You gotta be willing to ship something that's not perfect. Let me give you an example of something that shipped that wasn't perfect, but boy, did they get feedback fast. Have a watch and then I'll talk to you about it. Hi, I'm Tom Perrin for DR Power Equipment. Thanks for your interest in our new DR Super Saw. If you own a chainsaw, the Super Saw is the faster, easier way to cut and collect smaller size material without straining your back. As you know, cleaning up branches and smaller size logs with a chainsaw is hard work. You have to bend over to saw up all of the smaller leftovers, being extra careful to not dull your chain by touching it on the ground. And even when you're done sawing, you still have to bend over to pick up all the pieces. 
The Super Saw was designed to process all of your branches without having to bend over to cut them or to pick them up. With the Super Saw, you feed in material while standing in a comfortable upright position. An easily adjustable gauge helps you cut to the correct length for your wood stove or fireplace. And there's no more bending over to gather the cut pieces because each one drops neatly into a wheelbarrow or cart that you park underneath. With its six and a half horsepower overhead valve Briggs & Stratton engine, the Super Saw quickly cuts through branches up to six inches thick. The secret to its speed is in its patented beaver blade, which uses a cutting chain similar to the one on your chainsaw. So if you're tired of bending over to cut up all the small stuff and killing your back to pick it up, why not try out our new DR Super Saw on our six month risk free trial? You have nothing to lose except your aching back. So give us a call today to try out a Super Saw on your property. So they actually did that in seven days. From the point at which they got the technology, put it together in the back of their facility, took that video on an iPhone, which you can even hear the quality go in and out, prototyped it and tried to sell it to customers within seven days, something that normally would have taken them months to do. Months because they would normally be focused on perfection, and now the organization is focused on how can we get fast and smart, excuse me, get fail fast, fail cheap systems in place in order to get fast feedback from customers. They did the prototype, they learned tons by just putting it together, they shipped it to customers prematurely just so they can get so much smarter. And yes, sometimes people say, oh my gosh, that seems like it's gonna hurt my brand, then take the brand off to protect the family jewels. Three simple rules to keep in mind. Don't get hurt, don't cause others to get hurt, and don't do anything illegal. So as long as you're sticking to that, you should be good. Last way, last but not least, leaders lead by example. Fail fast, fail cheap is not a simple concept to put in place, so leaders need to take the first step first. You notice we said, you know what, all the way through, we want you prototyping the, through the process of innovation, and that means you're gonna get it wrong. Form over function, let it be ugly, it means we're gonna ship stuff that is wrong. Early on with small sets of people, reduce the risk. So we need the leader to demonstrate because I'm not gonna risk my career on fail fast, fail cheap until I see you, dear leader, living that same way. I wanna believe you that you really mean it. So the leader should be the first one to take out the ugly thing. Take it out to a customer and say, I trust your judgment. I know that we win when you win. I'm coming to you early in the process to fold in to make it better, us smarter on the whole. And they'll see you as a more innovative company. So that's five specific ways to do fail fast, fail cheap. Be clear about the death threats, figure out how to run an experiment around those death threats, build systems for prototyping and giving customer feedback, let it be ugly, and leaders have gotta take the lead. Now I've got a couple things to follow up for you. Um, a lot of people ask us how they can learn more because as you've probably noticed, this is quick and it's just off the surface. Two ways for you to learn more, executive programs, we teach people um, how to lead innovation. In Innovation College, we actually teach the whole curriculum of how to create, communicate, commercialize, and systematize innovation through those 48 skills. Um, and uh, because you're coming to this webinar, we do have a special offer that if you do a buy one, get one seat free for the executive program. So if you go onto the website, which I'll give you at the very end, and sign up today before five o'clock Eastern time, that's in roughly four hours from now, you do the, get the option to bring another person along at no additional cost. And as a thank you, we are offering for everybody who's been part of this webinar to partake, partake in an innovation assessment that we will do privately for your particular your company. It'll help you understand your strengths and the opportunities for your organization when it comes to innovation and really building an innovative culture. So it's more of a diagnostic tool to help you understand where are the parts that I can improve. And we're happy to do that for anybody who uh, reaches out. When you get a follow-up thank you from our um, webinar here, you'll get instructions on how you can participate. So with that, we have just a moment. I'm gonna uh, take a question or two and then we will kind of stay on the line a little bit longer to field any additional questions as they come. Uh, we did get a question, uh, will this webinar be recast? Yes, indeed it will. Um, it will be on YouTube. If you just search for Innovation Engineering on YouTube, it's part of our channel, so you can watch it to your heart's content. Uh, where do I phone, uh, find local innovation engineering partners? Um, thanks for that question. There are a number of partners throughout the world that offer innovation engineering through universities, all kinds of consultancies. There's 
upwards of 60 different partners. Um, and if you send us an email to Corey at EurekaRanch.com, I'll put our email up at the end, we will find you and connect you to a partner that makes the most sense. Sometimes it's geography, sometimes it's skill set. So we're happy to field that for you and connect you to the right partners. Corey at EurekaRanch.com. <clears throat> we'll take one more and then um, I'll close it out um, with a couple more slides, and, but we will stay on for additional questions and keep the lines open. How do I pick an innovation project to move forward? Great question. Um, when you use the new terminology that I'm going to, I use just on this webinar, so when you pick an innovation to move forward into the development process, it should be one that you've moved the death threats down to a manageable level. Now, it doesn't mean that they've been slaughtered and you know without any inkling of a doubt that you can absolutely overcome them. It simply means you've increased your confidence that those things that had a lot of uncertainty before have very little uncertainty now going into the development process. You want to make it so that you don't have any unexpected um, things happen that shouldn't. So as long as something has all the death threats resolved to a comfortable level, that's the point at which you would move something forward. So again, if you've run those fail fast, fail cheap cycles of experimentation, overcoming the death threats, those are the ones that should move forward into development. I also do want to let you know about, um, finally, the webinar series. It does continue. We do these on a regular basis. One I'd love to highlight for you is coming up on October 20th, where we're going to talk about one of the biggest issues when it comes to innovation, which is alignment. All across the board, we're seeing data that alignment is one of the most critical issues for an organization trying to do innovation and the misalignment and what it can do to your organization. So join us for that one on October 20th. Pencil that one in. And um, I'm going to leave up for you a few things here about how to uh, connect with us to learn more across the board. If you're interested in that executive program and you want to register, here's the website, as well as for the Innovation College um, to learn more about that, about how you might become an innovation engineering black belt and learn the 48 skills that go along with innovation engineering. Or go to our home website, innovationengineering.org, to register for future webinars on this topic and many, many others to come. So I'll leave that screen up here in the background, and then um, we'll take a couple of additional questions that have come in. So if you'd like to stay up on the line, you're welcome to join us. But for those of you who have come and that need to drop off, thank you very much. We hope to see you on our next webinar. Uh, the next question we have here, when do you kill an innovation project? Uh, that's a great question, and it's kind of got a lot of pieces to it. Um, part of the teaching that we have inside innovation engineering have people playing different roles in an innovation project. Now, the best design that we've ever seen is there's a person who runs the project called a project leader, supported by a management coach and a process coach to help them with innovation. Um, what we like to see, and this is very different than a lot of other business methods, is we actually like to see that the only person that can kill an innovation project is the project leader, the person running the project when they decide and reveal for themselves that they can no longer overcome a death threat that's been presented. It's a very different philosophy than many kind of critical business um, processes where management might make the choice of whether or not to go forward and to not go forward on ideas. Again, early on in an innovation project's life, life cycle, um, we like that decision to come from the project leader as a recommendation. Here's a death threat, I can't overcome it. Uh, it, it turns out this particular thing is illegal and there's no way I can get around it. That's the perfect moment to um, kill it. So when there's a death threat that you cannot overcome, it's a time to move on with an innovation project. And we rarely say kill, actually. We more often say archive because it's not that it might not work in the long run, but it might not work today. So we have a whole system of archiving projects to make sure that we've still got them because there's so many times where we've invented the solution for something perfectly a few years ago. It wasn't right then, but it is right now. So archiving. Another question here, how does FASTER help? Oh, actually, it, it helps on a couple of different fronts, one from more of an organizational perspective and one from more um, of an energy perspective. Faster helps from an organization's perspective is because innovation takes too long today. It takes way too long and therefore is way too costly. We can't wait forever for the answer to come about. So the faster we figure out whether or not an innovation has legs, the less likely we are to make bad bets in the long run. If we quickly vet an idea early on in the process, we avoid tons of cost 
and downside later on. So the faster we can move it out of the pipeline, the faster we can reassign resources as they move on to things that actually can work. So we wanna quickly cycle through, again, fast and cheap, not, not fast and expensive, not, not slow and expensive, fast and cheaply figure out why is this idea viable or can it be viable? In fact, our head statistician puts it the best way possible. He says, I like to start with the deadliest death threat because if this idea isn't gonna go anywhere, I don't wanna work on it. So I wanna figure out the fastest way to kill it. If it makes it through that gauntlet, I'm more than happy to invest more time and energy. Uh, faster also helps from a personal perspective. I think I'm sure all of us at one point or another have been part of a project or a project team or seen a project in an organization that has gone on far too long and nobody wants to call it out that, guys, really, we need to keep going on this? So the faster you get in innovation cycles, the better off you are. And in today's world, you can't be fast enough. If you look at the life cycle curve of every organization, it used to be a lot longer than it is today. Today, that life cycle curve has gotten shorter and shorter and shorter. If you don't go fast, your competition will just right by you. So you have to go fast to figure out what's viable or not. The, the competition will eat you up. We'll take one more question here, um, and then we'll uh, follow up with additional issues. You're more than welcome, again, to email us directly, Corey at EurekaRanch.com, to field additional questions. Um, can I see an example of a yellow card for a new idea that was taken through the fail fast, fail cheap exercise? Um, so this is uh, from one of our uh, folks who knows a little bit more about our terminology than maybe most folks on the line. A yellow card is sort of a shorthand for an idea. It's a way that we use to mechanize and uh, identify what an idea is. So it identifies what the customer is, what the problem is, promise and proof, like I mentioned in a brief way uh, during the webinar. So an example of an idea that's changed from beginning to end. I actually have a whole slide deck I could show you of a fantastic concept that um, actually came from the Edrington Group. We've got a couple of examples of theirs that are pretty cool. And the reason why, just to, just to be clear, the reason why we use a lot of product-based examples on these webinars is because they're simply easy to get. Most of the companies that use this, this type of process or are challenged with innovation are services, business to business, all that stuff. It's just that the examples of physical products are easier to explain in a training scenario. So this one was great. Um, it was a, as a new type of um, ginger beer that they were gonna offer. Now there aren't ter uh, too many ginger beers that really run the gamut and really deliver high. And uh, this one was uh, focused on Scotland. So their original incarnation was actually a serve idea so that when you went up to the bar, it was actually a novel way to serve ginger beer. Ginger beer was a combination of ginger beer, so ginger ale, and famous grouse, which was the alcohol that was put with it. Now, they even had sketches of what the original thing looked like. There were tokens to put in. You would actually go physically go deal with it at the counter. And every single week, they would run another experiment. They would change and adapt the idea. So the original was an on-serve um, uh, premise. Uh, by the time they actually iterated through, I think we have about eight different incarnations of what the idea changed to. The final one, their ginger beer, was actually a serve that they did at the bar, but they actually prepackaged. So they actually dealt with multiple things at the same time, as you'll find in innovations. The business model, how they went to market, how they packaged it, how they talked about it, how customers interacted with it and consumed it, and also how they sold it, on trade versus off trade. And that whole idea changed and adapted as they went further and uh, further and further into the process. That is one of the best byproducts of doing a fail fast, fail cheap methodology because the underpinning of that, fail fast, fail cheap, is that you learn and apply the learning. In fact, with many of the companies that we see in organizations that use this type of approach, the idea actually has greater value when they ship than what they thought at the beginning because they continue to change and adapt the idea as they learn. Um, <clears throat> if you have any additional questions, and I know there are many here that we did not get to, but I'm trying to respect time, please feel free to reach out directly to email us, to call. Uh, the contact information is there for you up on the slide. I'll put it up face to face again. Um, reach out to us. And there's our phone number at the bottom, or you can reach out to Corey at EurekaRanch.com to learn more and to get some questions answered. Thank you all very much for your time. We appreciate it. And again, we hope to see you on another webinar another time soon. Take care.